Money is the most important economic good in any economy. It's involved in every transaction in a system. It pervades every market, every trade, every deal, every exchange, goes through money. Um, and, and so what we find is, is that that's the, the mechanism by which the complex division of a labor economy based on comparative advantage is supported. So when you think about this for a moment, uh, money solves what's called the double coincidence of wants problem. In other words, in a barter world, you may have apples and I have oranges. And I, I want apples, but you don't want oranges. You, you might want bananas. So I have to find somebody with bananas that wants oranges. But he doesn't want oranges. He wants kiwi fruit. I've got to find a guy with kiwi fruit that wants oranges. He doesn't want oranges. He wants papayas. You see the problem. And in a barter economy, finding somebody who has what you want to exchange for what you have is a freak accident. It happens, but it's rare. And the reality is, is not only is it a medium of exchange, but money becomes a unit of account. It is impossible to do financial accounting in a barter world. It's impossible. You have to have a common denominator, a common unit of account that you can quote all values in terms of as revenues and expenses. So profit loss accounting and capital allocation cannot take place in any systemic processing of information way without accounting, and you can't have accounting without a medium of exchange. And furthermore, money becomes a store of value where you can separate your production from your exchange in the future, and you can store value in that unit of account and medium of exchange. With a store of value function, you now can have savings in a very real way that is standardized, unit of account savings that can be accounted for financially and that allows for the banking structure to emerge. This allows for savings and investment, capital uh, allocation and accumulation, which allows for productivity. So in other words, our productivity is dependent on this institution that allows this complex fine division of labor, allows these other subsidiary institutions of accounting, that allows the emergence of banking and savings and investment, without which, going back to a barter world, that entire structure will then implode and collapse. And inflation is the tax on the value of the medium of exchange. It sabotages the integrity of the institution. It destroys financial accounting. Accountants are always obsessed with trying to find ways to adjust for inflation such that the numbers they're actually looking at have coherent meaning throughout the time period. Uh, it destroys the incentive to save and accumulate. Uh, it is just a, just a poison. It's toxic poison on the economy. In inflation is a tax on the value of the cash balances held by certain members of the general public. And inflation is a tax, and it is also a redistribution of real resources. So if I'm a counterfeiter and I print up my own little currency and I pass it off, I have more real purchasing power at existing prices. This gives me more real clout in the auction of the marketplace. I draw real resources to me. Counterfeiters get rich, so I might buy yachts. I might print up a billion dollars and buy yachts. But I didn't supply anything of real value to get yachts. I just printed up billion one dollar bills. Somebody will pay for those yachts, but it certainly wasn't me because I didn't give you know a million lectures to have to get the yacht. So who paid for it? As the cash is spread from pocket to pocket, purse to purse, bank account to bank account, it spreads into more and more cash balances. And so the initial injection of the money is where the new money source of creation comes from. It gets real purchasing power from nowhere. However, as money spreads through the economy, more and more prices are bid upwards, and that cash will then land into the cash balances of a broader array of the general public. They will pay higher prices of the things they buy. Maybe they don't buy just yachts, they buy other things. And they will get cash balances at an increased rate at which the rate of prices are rising. And those are the break-evens. They don't fall behind inflation. They're not ahead of it. 
So if I didn't pay for the yacht and they didn't pay for the yacht, who did pay for the yacht? Those are people who received the increased cash balances at the very end of the stream. All year long, they've been paying higher prices with their existing cash balances, and the real value of their money has gone down by the price level rising. Therefore, it is the final group that is behind the inflation curve. They either do not keep up with inflation, they might get a 3% raise and prices rise 7%. They're actually falling behind. They have paid the tax to me to buy that yacht. Government is always in the first group. It has known the inflation tax, the ability to counterfeit uh, for 2,500 years. They did this with the coins of ancient Athens, and they start the process of debasement, delusion, uh, nationalizing the mint, which was a private enterprise and became a government function. In other words, government now has an extra source of revenue. One is honest taxes in your face, where you can at least hold them to account. Another one is dishonest taxes that tax the integrity of the most important institution of all of life. That's the danger. There have been literally hundreds of cases of hyperinflation in world history. And in the last 30 years or so, there's been at least a dozen or more serious cases of hyperinflation. The two that come to mind that teach me lessons tremendously is first the, the biggest one in the early uh, uh, world, the ancient world, was in the Roman Empire. And the Roman emperors uh, had 1,500 uh, uh, mints, minting worthless coins. They had four coins of the old Roman Empire. And they had the Arius gold coin and the silver denarius coin. Those were the two main coins. And they start debasing the coin. They start and mixing in inferior metals. They mix lead into silver. They mix a little copper into gold, a little tin in there, and so forth. And that debasement is uh, monetization. It's an increase in the quantity of money. And they did this to finance budgetary deficits of the late Roman Empire. And of course, they eventually made the silver denarius coin a lead coin with a few flakes of silver rubbed on it. And they called it a silver coin. And to show you what happened, they had such hyperinflation of such grand proportions. In the uh, first century, at the time of Jesus, uh, it took six little denarius silver pure coins to get one bushel of wheat. Um, about 300 years later, it took two million denarius coins to get one bushel of wheat. Um, and that's when the, the empire was in com complete collapse at this point because these were worthless coins. And there were legal tender laws attached to those worthless coins. And if you did not take that denarius coin or you did not take that uh, debased aureus coin that was mixed with inferior metals or clipped or shaved and diluted and filed, uh, there was the death penalty attached to it. The first legal tender laws had death penalty attached to them. In fact, most legal tender laws throughout most of world history have had death penalty attached to them. Now, we don't today, we don't have death penalty attached to it, but you get all your, the debts that people owe you canceled out if you do not accept the legal tender. So, so this was a way governments forced people to accept their worthless money, which allowed government the ability to counterfeit and therefore force taxation on the public. And what happens is, as the government would spend these worthless coins, they're in the first group again. They get real resources to buy support and alliances and so forth. And then as the people see the prices rise and the value of their coins become worthless, they get angry. And then the government directs the anger towards the merchant raising the prices. See, it's the baker raising the price of bread. He's too greedy. It's the winemaker. See, he's too greedy. He's raising prices. He's gouging. He's gouging. And, and therefore, then they usually come in with price controls. And of course, we saw this with the Edict of Diocletian in 301. They put maximum price controls. And so when you have maximum price controls trying to push prices down, while you have monetization of deficits pushing prices up, this creates a repressed hypermonetary inflation, where then you have massive shortages, which reduce the real quantity of goods and services. Whatever the quantity of money is, if there's less goods and services, prices go up again. And so, so uh, repressed hypermonetary inflation is magnify inflation. It's a pressure cooker that you stop the, the escape valve on the steam. 
So that's the, wor the worst macro possibility. It's not just hyperinflation, but hyperinflation with price controls. You might think they learned, but we didn't because we know there was an Ossinot inflation in France in the 1790s. There was a hyperinflation of the U.S. continental during our Revolutionary War. We know there was the Weimar German inflation. We know that there was the Hungarian Pengo inflation after World War II. Um, and as I've said, uh, in the last 30 years, we have dozens of runaway hyperinflations in Argentina, in Brazil, in Poland, in Zimbabwe, in Bolivia. We can go down the list. So have we learned? No, we haven't learned anything. Whenever governments get into extraordinary fiscal pressures, where they spend vastly more than they get through direct taxes. They have to either borrow or print. There's no third option. And what happens is they run their limit on borrowing, and then they start printing, which is really they'll borrow from their central bank. And the central bank just creates new money. It's called monetization. So we know we haven't learned because we're having extraordinarily high fiscal deficits, not just in America, but in the Eurozone. The inflation statistics that are reported are not true. They're not correct. Uh, if you go to shadow government statistics and look at the actual inflation rate, it's about 6 to 7% higher than what the actual CPI is because they've changed the methodology by which they construct that index. And so they've taken food out, they've taken gasoline out. In other words, anything where prices are rising, they pull it out of the index. They say this is wildly volatile, and it's always on the volatile up that they pull them out to keep the numbers uh, artificially low. The reality is, is that the inflation rate probably is anywhere from 7 to 10 percent minimum on the low side right now. And how do we know that in the United States? The producer price index, which is less prone to these kinds of arbitrary things on the consumer price index, over the last 12 months has had roughly at about a 7 percent inflation rate. So that, that's, that's probably a closer proxy for it. What we know is the money supply, M1, over the last year has increased over 20 percent. M2 has increased over double digits, over 10% as well, just in this last year. And this is after all the quantitative easing has ended. That's after it ended. It was much higher earlier. In the Eurozone, it's the same, it's the same story. It's all about what you count and what you don't count. Uh, governments get elected by spending money. That's how you win elections and re-elections, promising to deliver stuff. And if you can promise to deliver stuff on things you promise not to take from people, that even works better. So we have the proclivity to spend but not directly tax. But everything government spends is a tax. It's not direct necessarily, because that might lose your votes, but indirect through either borrowing, which crowds out and raises interest rates, which is a tax on investment in the future and consumption in the future, or you're printing money, which is a tax on the value of the institution of money, which lowers the purchasing power of people behind the inflation curve. So the reality is, is this, is that government will spend and then they will hide the tax. They will hide it and they will attach it to the medium of exchange and then blame the scapegoats for raising prices. Now, wh why I say this is because that's, that's a fact in democratic societies. This is why they're prone to deficits, as Jim Buchanan likes to say. Uh, it's democracy and perpetual and chronic and exploding deficits. Those deficits will become monetized. And this gets to the next reason. When Americans look at Europe and, and the, uh, the 27 countries of the European Union and the 17 of the Eurozone, when we look at countries like Greece and Italy and France and Spain and Portugal, what we see is they've Europe has gone through a demographic transition of the age structure of their population about a decade before America. They're an older culture in Europe than we are in America. We're a younger society. And the reality is there's all these entitlement programs attached to the age structure of the population, Social Security benefits and health benefits and so forth. Now, the problem is, of course, the demographics are reality. People are who they are in the age one year, every year. And that structure is ballooned in Europe, and there's no money to pay for these benefits. And in fact, they've even gone worse, where they've lowered retirement ages and expanded the benefits, but they can't collect the direct taxes for it. 
they have very high tax rates, but then nobody pays it. Everyone evades it. And you can't collect taxes on that black market. The only alternative is monetize all this. They'll go into debt, and that's exactly what they've done, and eventually the pressure is to monetize this. So, so we are going to be Greece in five years. I don't know any economist who does not think America is going to not be Greece in five to ten years. That, that's a certainty. That's an absolute certainty, like gravity. We will become Greece. Nothing changes. And the reason we will become Greece is we have a demographic transition going on right now. The baby boom in the next couple of years begins its mass retirement. The post-war baby boom is now hitting us. And what we know, according to the Department of Census, Bureau of Census, that actually does the enumeration and counts everybody, and their age structures, and their incomes, and their houses, and how many rooms they have, you know, they do all the enumeration. The demographics that the Census Bureau tells us is this. Every day for the next 25 years, eight to 10,000 people on average will be net retirees. Eight to 10,000 people per day, every day for the next 25 years. And that's a ballooning population of elderly for the next, every day for the next 25 years. And it's not just that we got more entitlements, so we're gonna owe them this money, but they're gonna leave the labor force to get this entitlement. And if, if you understand in labor economics, there's life cycle of income, that your income is lowest when you're youngest because you have less human capital, less experience, less, less uh, education. And over your life, young people will grow older and they will get more experience and more education and more training and their income goes up. And statistically, worldwide, we know that people when they reach about 50 to 60 will peak out at max earnings. After about 60, because of physical problems, their productivity will fall a little bit, and their income will fall a little bit. So in other words, people will be at their peak earnings capacity, paying maximum taxes for Social Security, for Medicare, for income taxes. Those people, eight to 10,000 every day, will go from pay, being the peak tax paying years, at the maximum amount we're paying in, to becoming pure tax consumers, maximum drain out of the system. Every day, eight to 10,000. Every day, quit paying taxes and now say, give me everything I, I deserve under the law. Both of those things combined are going to destroy the entire semblance of what we think is a federal budget. And we have to pay for it somehow. So we know structurally Social Security and Medicare are broke, and we have trillions and trillions of unfunded liabilities we're going to owe them once they retire. And every day for the next 25 years, eight to 10,000 quit paying taxes at the top of their earnings life and become pure tax consumers for the rest of their life. And we don't have the money to pay it. There's not enough money on the face of the earth to pay this. So right. then what are we left with? Someone's going to be shafted, big time, huge. Problem is those old people are not going to let you vote benefit cuts because that one thing they do have is they go in and vote, and they vote their interests very consistently. So here's the problem. Old people are going to vote their interest. We're not going to take away that right to vote. So now you've got to convince them that we're in deep trouble and they have to be part of this. And the reality is, is that I have no reason to believe anybody has come to terms with that hard reality. I, I just don't have any reason to believe that. I don't see many uh, seniors groups standing up saying, you know, if we have to cut and modify Medicare and Social Security and downscale the benefits, let's do it, whatever it takes. I don't hear anybody doing this. All I hear them saying is, you're not cutting my thing or I'll vote you out. So who's going to pay for this? What's going to happen is we're going to have massive deficits and the Federal Reserve will buy all that debt. That's called inflation and that's going to wipe out the medium of exchange. The problem is, is for generations, politicians have taken money from people that were paying these taxes for Social Security and Medicare. And they said, it's there, it's there, it'll be there for when you get old. And what they did is they bought short-run elections 
with unfunded liabilities because it won't happen until you retire, so they got time to work on it. Problem is now the demographics have, they're retiring. The money isn't there. And now these programs are bankrupt. And um, just, so, uh, just to give you a heads up, just Social Security and Medicare alone, the Social Security and the Medicare trustees, the trustees report point out Medicare Part A, B, and D, and Social Security, the old age survivors disability uh, program, all of them combined, just those two programs, Medicare and its three subdivisions, and Social Security, $108 trillion of unfunded debt that will become funded debt once they retire. And that's not including the regular national debt, that's not including the other parts of the budget where we're spending more money than we're bringing in to pay for. So the total unfunded liabilities in the United States is over $200 trillion. Social Security and Medicare are at least half that. And the entire wealth of the United States, all land, every building, every car, every, uh, you know, every washing machine, CBO tells us is $50 trillion. So we have debts four times more than the possibility if you sold the entire United States off. So you can't tax your way out of it. We're not going to be able to grow our way out of it. We're not going to be able to borrow our way out of it. But we're going to try and print our way out of it. And that will take down the medium of exchange. That is absolute certainty like gravity. It's coming. You know, in Weimar, Germany, when they had their hyperinflation, pri the prices rose by a factor of 10 billion to one in 16 months. And you say, how fast can inflation like accelerate? Prices went up 10 billion to one in 16 months. Think about it. You buy a Big Mac today for $2 at McDonald's. 16 months from now, a year and four months, you pay $20 billion. That's how fast this can happen. Now, what saved Germany uh, was the fact that there were foreign monies in Germany circulating. So before the run-up of hyperinflation, 1921, 22, 23, in that period, there were other currencies circulating widely throughout the country. There were U.S. dollars, Italian lira, French francs, Swiss francs, and Dutch florins. Those were the big outside currencies. And they circulated throughout the country. And in German shops, you could go in and they would have three or four or five prices for the same thing, depending on what kind of money you were paying. It is estimated that the value, the real purchasing power, all that foreign money in Germany at the beginning of the hyperinflation was equal to two-thirds of the value of the German money supply. So in other words, when they printed German marks so fast, so furiously, people quit using German marks. You know, people were dumping their German marks to go get real goods because the prices were doubling statistically every three days over the three days before, and that happened for 16 consecutive months. So people would start trading with other currencies, dollars or francs or, or lira or florins. And what this did was with the collapse of the German mark with hyperinflation, the flight to real goods, as von Mises likes to call it, there were other currencies to take up the medium of exchange in what limited areas they could so that trade can continue. This puts a floor below the collapse of productivity because the division of labor can still go on to some extent, although not as efficient with a nationwide currency that everyone is using. Here's what happened in Germany. The, the per capita productivity collapsed 50% in one year. 30 percentage points of that was in two months. Now, what happened in Germany in two months took four years in America in the Great Depression. So 48 months of the collapse of productivity in our Great Depression, <laughs> Germany did it in two months. That is the value of the medium of exchange. You lose it, bam, you lose it all. You lose your whole productive capacity. What saved Germany was this other money they kept trading with, which put a floor from the complete collapse into zero. Now, I always look at this and I say, okay, so Germany was saved by outside monies that they were f familiar with using. The shops, the restaurant, everybody would use multiple currencies. They were familiar with that. 
One was being inflated, you use the other. Life goes on. In America, everything from the McDonald's to the dry cleaners, from Kansas to Alabama, only use dollars. We don't use yen, we don't use euros, we don't use yuan, we don't use pesos, we don't use any of that stuff. There's no other medium of exchange in America but U.S. dollars. And that makes us in an extraordinary vulnerable position because there's no fallback to another medium of exchange to continue the division of labor. The reason Bernanke and others talk about deflation, he's a student of the Great Depression, and in fact, in my book on the Great Depression, I cite some of Bernanke's stuff. And the reality was there was a deflation. There was an implosion of the, the fractional reserve banking structure, bank runs, and so forth. And that was true. There's no question about that. Now, the problem you're facing today is the opposite end of the deal, right? You do have financial trouble in the banking structure. I mean, it's very great insolvency problems that are emerging very quickly, partly coming out of Europe with the sovereign debts, all Greek debt defaulting, banks in Europe, those banks that are tied to American banks, it's all interconnected. So, so the reality, and of course a lot of our banks have a lot of these toxic assets, these mortgage-backed securities, that's what the old TARP bill was, to try and buy them out of the banks to save the banks. Now it's true if the banking structure implodes, that would tend to be a depressant on the price level. That would only be true if the actual banking structure implodes and the quantity of money and credit implodes. We don't see any signs of that. What we see is the quantity of money increasing at 20 and 25 percent rates of growth. The opposite. The opposite. And what I've always said is Bernanke will try to save the banks by destroying the medium of exchange, which is infinitely worse than the banks coming down. And why do I say this? In the Great Depression, which was caused by the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, and a variety of other bad policies, even at the worst case, after 10,421 banks failed, 40% of all commercial banks failed, which was horrendous, no question about that, nobody can dispute that, you had 25% of the labor market out of work. You still had 75% of the labor market still working. So in other words, if you knew somebody was out of work and you kept your job and you were still working, you could take care of somebody who didn't have the means of support. And in fact, those who were still working saw prices fall. So their purchasing power of what they were earning was greater. And so I always tell people, even in the Great Depression, if you had a job, 75% of the labor force did have jobs, 25% didn't. Those people that were still working had a wealth effect that hit them. And they could actually then take care of a neighbor or a cousin or a relative to tide them over till they can find work. With the destruction of the medium of exchange, you also take down those banks. You take down the banks, you take financial accounting down, you take the division of labor down. And the question is, now who's there to help you? So I just like to say Bernanke will save the banks. So I don't think there's any question about that. He is hell-bent on he will not be presiding over the next Great Depression. As a student of the Great Depression, he understands that. And it may be true, he will probably save those banks. He'll print the, all the money he needs to keep banks floating. There's only one problem. All of this will sabotage the most important thing in those banks. And the most important thing in every bank and in every transaction, the medium of exchange will be wiped out. That's the game he's playing. This is the danger we face. And politics and demographics push us right to that edge. So I'm a passionate defender for a balanced budget and a balanced spending requirement to the Constitution. I think, I think the states have to take control of this. I think the American people need to call their legislators and say, let's get a state amendment process to not only balance the federal budget by law, but tie it to a spending percentage of the GDP and tie that spending percentage to whatever we're spending currently on the enumerated powers alone. If that's 10% or 8% or 
and then the states can take control of this thing and tell the federal government, you will obey the Constitution, and we're giving you X amount percentage of GDP, and if you want to spend it on non-enumerated things that are not listed in the Constitution, it's coming out of the enumerated stuff. So when there are no police to show up and there are no roads to drive on, people are going to wonder why are you still issuing foreign aid checks? Why are you still issuing farm subsidies? Why, then the American people have to come to terms with how much they want these unconstitutional entitlements and how much they want constitutional functions actually funded. So my belief is a couple of things. One, we need to, to go through the states to put controls on the federal government. Our founders gave us that power with the amendment process. Secondly, every American in this country has to look in the mirror. And we got to decide, do we really want to rob our grandkids? And we have to look in the mirror. And it may be, we may realize, hey, we've been robbed. Yeah, I know, but does this give us the right to rob our grandkids? We have to find a way that old people don't starve on the streets because their money was already taken from them to begin with. And at the same time, we've got to find a way that the children aren't made slaves. And we've got to find a way we don't destroy the dollar. Or we have to find a way to exit that dollar, which is what my preference is. So I tell people, I say, look, we need to get off of the Federal Reserve dollar. We need to find any way possible to find alternative currency, preferably based with some precious metal that's redeemable gold, silver, platinum, I don't care what it is, some type of commodity. And we have to get back to the rule of law in this country. And we have to be honest. At some point, as I tell elderly Americans, we have to look at our kids and grandkids and say, I value you. Your future interest is my interest. That even though I won't be here, I have a duty to you as, as, as my children and my grandchildren, to leave you a world better than I have. We've lost that moral ethic because we just vote our interest. We need to be thinking about our children for the first time. And we need to, th not just in words, but in practice. And we need to tell our politicians, you know what, I'm going to give you some room, cut my benefits, but I want my kids out. I want them out of this problem. If you can't get me out of this problem, you can't get my kids out of this problem, we will then impose law on you through the Constitution. Um, so, so there's a range of things. I'm not very optimistic, to be honest with you. I do, the, the one thing that does make me optimistic, I'll just tell you straight up, is I think there's an urgency that people are having. I see this in these Tea Party rallies, I, I speak to a lot of them, and I see elderly people that are desperately worried that the country is going down a financial rat hole. They see it. They know this money's wasted. It's all thrown down a rat hole. And yet their lives are tied up in it. They paid taxes for 50 years and now they're old. They want their money, but they don't want their grandkids to be impoverished. And that is a practical problem. That really is. But at least they've acknowledged the problem. If you don't acknowledge the problem, you can never diagnose correctly. You can never answer it correctly. So I say the first order of business is let's be truthful. So as I tell everybody, it's time for truth.